we go. You guys can see me all right? Oh, you look great. There you go, bud. All right. Very handsome indeed. Awesome. Yeah, looking good. How's the sound? Uh, well, let me see. Uh, I have this fancy mic, so we definitely want to make sure that y'all can hear me through the through the fancy mic. Uh, yeah, guys, I'm ready to go. I'm Are ready you ready to, to rock go. and roll, my <laughs> man? Yeah. I, I, I well, pulled we, out we my <laughs> All right, so have you used Audacity before? Kanye. <laughs> oh, can you hear there me we now? Go. There oh, we go. Oh, you know what? It was muted. I think <laughs> I think I had it on mute. Okay. I think we're good. Sweet. All right, are we clicking on one on on 3? Yeah. What, uh, what we're going to we're going to click on 4. So 1 2 3 record. <laughs> All right, on the 4. All right. That works. All right. You guys Great <laughs> <laughs> guys, how are you, my man? How's things going today? <laughs> Being a good day, my man. How about you? Yeah, very good, bud. Um, very good. Still a little bit early in the morning, or well, sort of, not really, but uh, yeah, it's been a good morning. <laughs> yeah, how was your how was your day in, in the office, bud? Yeah, but really good. There was some nice people around and. Uh, the guy that I work with, he was on a conference, so it's always like exciting because he's got new cool stuff, new research to like share and stuff. So oh, that's, that's cool. always fun. So we like had a chat about some of that, and uh, yeah, and um, even more exciting is that we get to get on a call now and uh, and uh, have a chat about some awesome guests. So yeah, yeah really that- a good day. That's cool, my man. It's uh, it's always nice learning new things, isn't it? And um, you know, like in relation to our chat uh, this week, um, you know, the I guess the learning part is is around books, and you and I, I think, are both pretty lucky. Like, you know, growing up, we we both read quite a fair bit, didn't we? And um, yeah. I think you said you could recite some of the passages that you read in in a book that <laughs> <laughs> from from when we you were a young boy which one was that so yeah i just had this memory when we were discussing this you know and we were when we were chatting to our guest this week uh elvin irby uh it, it brought back a memory of when i was a kid and um i, I my we, we like you said we were pretty lucky because uh we had books in the house and our parents read to us, which is really special. You know, that's a special time, obviously, as a kid, but uh, uh, it's also an important time for your development. Um, and I remember reading um, The Tale of the Flopsy Bunnies, <laughs> which is by <laughs> which is by a famous author, Beatrix Potter. And in that book, um, I still remember that I remember reading a word, which were, the word was soporific. Jeez. And these bunnies had uh, had eaten uh, the farmer's cabbages, and they are they were like lying in the sun and just relaxing. And I can still remember not knowing what it meant, and and um, my mom then sort of explaining it to me, and I and I still remember it. And I thought that's that's pretty special. Uh, and uh, just thanks from from reading a book as a kid. And I know you also mentioned during our chat that you'd you'd read. Or you remember the really cool book that you read when you were younger? Yeah. Well, firstly, what does soporific mean? So soporific is just, um, I'm going to probably butcher it now a little <laughs> bit, but uh, <laughs> it's basically just, uh, you know, you, you've, you're you just super relaxed and, and lazy after you, basically, you maybe when you've had a meal or something and you, uh, you're yeah. lying there and you're relaxed and yeah. So. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> something That's a cool attention. word, actually. I think I get Great soporific word. a few times a day. <laughs> yeah, no, totally right. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's, it's interesting. There's actually two that I remember. The, the first one was, I think, was in like grade one or something. And it was literally the first book that we got given. And it was this book about I can't remember the name of it, but it was like about a monkey or something. And the monkey, <laughs> and every single page that you turned, there was only one word, and it was look. And and that was the word. You turned it, Ooh. and it was look. 
and and I just I don't know why, but I just recall <laughs> that one. <laughs> but it was literally like our first our first book in grade one, um, wow, or maybe before cool. grade one. I can't remember when it was exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one that I recall like more as a sort of a younger boy. I don't think I was a teenager. It was before that. Uh, was um, the Secret Diary of Adrian Mole, and um, ah, it was classic. It was this like. 13 year old little boy and he, he wrote this diary and every single day there was an in- entry in it and it was it was funny because it was so relatable as a young boy you know he was talking about I don't know like his body and girls and all these sort of yeah. things and it was it was a really cool read you know because you could oh. could really relate to it um, and that's the cool thing about you know our guest this week isn't it he's he's created something quite quite awesome like really awesome actually um and made it very relatable for kids to read hey craig for sure yeah for sure it's 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 a really remarkable thing that he's doing and uh we we really stand for it and and think it's a great initiative it's it's called barbershop books and um he's found a way to to add such value in a research-based way to his target market in a in a in a way that's proven to be the most effective age group, but also he's found a clever way of introducing that uh, at, that, at that age, and that's in a barbershop. So what he does basically is, uh, what he's busy doing is, he's getting books um, that are age appropriate. I think it was f- from like four years old. Um, and at that age, you can imagine Maybe dad's getting his hair cut or older brother or whatever. And the little, the, the sort of teenagers are on their phones, but the little kids are just sitting there. They're not really, they don't have anything to do. And this, you know, Alvin saw this as a golden opportunity to let one of the, the, let the kids pick up a book and, and have a read. And, uh, and in doing so, this is, it's actually got a massive, um, knock-on effect on on on, on kids uh, uh, specifically black, black kids and kids of color uh, in the states uh, and this effect is 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 going to be in theory and research based actually going to have massive changes for for these children down the track hey yeah absolutely it's just it's such a such a unique idea but it's it's also so simple you know what I mean like just getting in there with these uh, with these youngsters uh, in their their free time and and you know still in a lot of parts of the world like the barber shops are where people convene and they they get together and they chat and you know um, and it's just it's just really 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 uh, really interesting and and like you said it's, a lot of it is research based too he's also gone out there and asked the the boys you know what do you like reading you know mm. so it's not about forcing something on them like oh you must read about the history of america and human rights or something like that it's about no let's give them something cool to read something fun just so that they start reading like that's all it is just so that they can find some sort of enjoyment and that's really cool and the other really cool thing about alvin is that He's a comedian too, so he brought a lot of fun to the chat, and that was really cool. He told us some good jokes, um, and also we went into like a little bit about the mindset of comedians, you know. And and these guys are super clever. Like I, we have both always thought that, you know, uh, you and me, Craig. Yeah. And you know, it, it takes a lot to kind of get onto stage, be funny tell a story and to yeah just to sort of captivate your crowd you know what i mean there's like there's a proper art to it and uh, elvin also tells us about you know like comedians actually being nerds you know they they properly go into their their subjects you know and they all use different means and ways of doing things be it one-liners or long stories or facial expressions or the tone of their voice you know what i mean to kind of bring out the joke that little bit more and they practice day in day out and it is properly an art to be a 
great comedian. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Do you actually do you have any favorites, Craig, yourself? Well, just just before we get to that, I, I totally agree with you. Like I, the, the skill of being able to hold a whole crowd, just you on your own, no accompaniment, and make people laugh consistently. It must be super stressful as well. Like if, you know, when you're sitting there and no one's having a laugh, it must be devastating. And um, the the cool thing is that uh, you know, um, Alvin actually uses his his comedy now to to raise some funds for for his um, for his projects. Um, which is really cool. Uh, so to be able to combine that that humor, and he bridges the gap between serious topics uh, like the ones we're discussing now, and then brings a, a humorous element to it, which I think is really smart as well. You know, you know, for us, we we've also you know idolized lots of comedians for that same reason: is that you, you can many social issues can be sort of have, you can have a laugh at it, and um, and and it becomes more relatable and something you can actually end up talking about, which is kind of cool. Um, and he actually, Elvin actually uses his, his comedy in a book that he wrote, um, Gross Greg. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, which is cool because it's totally relatable to kids. It's, it's kids get to have a laugh, um, and be kids, just allow them to be kids. So coming back to your question, I would have to say one of my favorites is, is certainly, uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, just because, you know, <laughs> He's unapologetic uh, in his ways, uh, and he's he's damn funny. And uh, I just yeah, I, just his facial expressions, his expressions, and uh, the topics he touches on in a in a really like funny way without being too offensive. Even though the topics are quite offensive sometimes, uh, it's really smart. And for you, who's yeah. who's up there for you? I, I, there's one that always stands out and or there's probably two actually but more old school is Robin Williams like yeah. I I just totally love him like he's so clever or he he he, he was so yeah. clever and funny you know I remember watching his uh, live on Broadway and I was just in hysterics I was literally on the floor and it just got better and better and better and the thing was like afterwards you saw the sort of extra clips and whatnot he hadn't even prepared anything before he went on stage Jeez. which is quite phenomenal you know and that that sort of yes. just reiterates how smart these guys are and how they can just yeah. speak off the cuff which is which is so yeah just so um, amazing um Incredible. but yeah you know also and then just just bringing it back here um to elvin like you said his book is so cool and it's it's just the right way to go about it you know what i mean bring some comedy uh, get kids interested, make them laugh, and just make reading enjoyable. And and it's a, it's a really cool touch that he adds to it. And you know yeah. we we really sort of have a heartfelt response from both of us to this whole uh, business that he set up. And we really do wish him all the success in the future. And and it's a really cool chat. And we're sure you'll enjoy it. So. Now's a good time for us to hear what it's like for Alvin Irby to be ridiculously human. All right. Well, we're here with Alvin Irby, a real interesting man. He's a comedian. He's a teacher, an educator, social change man. And uh, we're really excited to have a chat to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, I am a social change man. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And uh, how's your day been this morning? Well, this oh, afternoon? my my day, uh, my day's good. You know, all is well here in New York. It's a beautiful day. Has it uh, has it warmed up a little bit for you guys? Because it's been it chilly, has, hasn't it? It has warmed up a little bit. It was, uh, it, yeah, we were having some cold days. I mean, we had snow in April, you know. So, yeah, it's definitely start to warm up. Yeah, that's cool. But um, yes. yeah, because we like. In London, like it's, we had one week where it warmed up last week, and then now it's just, it just feels like the Arctic again. It's just like, come on, <laughs> summer. <laughs> it was a tease. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> so, so Elvin, tell us a little bit about uh, your t your typical day. What does your day entail, generally speaking? I mean, my days uh, can be all over the place, really, just depending on, you know, uh, what I have going on. So. You know, Barbershop Books has a, a, a desk <laughs> down in an office, 
Uh, and so, you know, I, I spend, you know, several hours there each day, you know, working on uh, various things, whether that be answering emails, you know, having conference calls. Um, and then, you know, I'm also, you know, meeting uh, regularly with various people uh, in the city. Uh, I also, you know, uh, do speaking engagements. So, you know, I give keynotes and lead workshops, uh, mostly on the topic of cultural competency, you know, really just kind of helping educators, uh, librarians, you know, education administrators think about how to make, uh, you know, learning and reading more relevant and engaging. And so, you know, when I have those events, uh, you know, I uh, am traveling, you know, so I'll be heading over to Maryland uh, this uh, week to lead a workshop with uh, some educators. So, you know, my weeks, they really do vary from 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 week to week, uh, you know, and then in the evenings, you know, several uh, nights a week, I, I am I'm getting on stage telling jokes, you know, as a comedian. So, <laughs> yeah. We, ho we hope you have some good ones lined up for us, bud, because we, uh, <laughs> we like a good joke, that's for sure. <laughs> Do you have any ones well, about, like, South Africans, maybe? <laughs> uh, no, no, not yet. Not, yeah. not yet. Well, maybe after well, we this give conversation, you will, yeah. Yeah, you'll be like, oh, my God, these South guys Africa, I spoke to. South Africa, though, you got, they're, they're like, uh, experiencing some, uh, some, some interesting uh, political uh, kind of situations right now, right, yeah. with... People confiscating land and all kind of other stuff. Yeah, but I mean, it's it, to be fair, it's it's been happening for you know for hundreds of years, and it's uh, yeah. But it now, I guess, it, it's sort of becoming a bit more you know out there in terms of they they taking a few more steps now to take some white farms and things like that. But you know, I mean, that's just part of uh, that's just part of growing up in Africa, and um, you, yeah, it's it's not. It, it maybe it's not it's not ideal the way they're probably thinking about going about it but um let's see what happens like we hopefully hopefully it's not uh like tragic or horrific or anything like that and, and it can be done in the right way yeah well if hopefully there's uh yeah like you said like uh some good on the other side of all of that yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah for sure yeah so um as a comedian i mean i guess there's always when you're looking around, when life's happening, I guess you're getting all these these ideas and stuff day to day. Or how do you how do you go about getting your material? Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely exactly like that. I definitely feel like uh, comedic inspiration is everywhere. You know, even in the worst of situations, uh, you know, there's just so much funny. I mean, I remember, <laughs> you know, going through the uh, the airport, uh, Chicago airport. And, you know, the TSA, which is, you know, like the people who, you know, check your bags and, you know, mm. make you go through metal detectors. You know, they they pull me to the side and like, you know, we're going to need to search you. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> and, but no, but then they said something I've never heard a TSA agent say in my life. They said, sir, we're going to need to check your groin area. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like. You know, I'm, I'm telling them, I'm like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure I don't, I don't have any metal down there. And then, and then they point to this, this screen, and it has a yellow box right around my groin area. And, I, and I'm like, well, that's really weird. And the guy, the guy, the TSA agent, leans over to me and says, yeah, that's a common misconception. The machines, they don't just check for metal; they also check for density. And that's what I said. oh my god. I had no idea. I had no idea that the, that these machines were so sophisticated. So, all this time, all this time I thought the TSA agents were like races or something, but it turns out that some of the passengers just have more density than others. And you know, so anyway, Initially, I was I was kind of upset about getting kind of pulled over, but then after that happened, I was like, "This is gonna be hilarious." I was like, you know, so I was like, "Yeah, this was totally worth being, you know, stopped and searched because you just you can't make this stuff up, you know, you really just can't make this stuff up." So anyway, I say all that to say that yes, comedic inspiration is everywhere all the time. Uh, that's <laughs> classic but so 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 did you get searched and then you know oh, no, was it validated I did get <laughs> well you know the crazy thing is that this has actually happened to me 
at more than one airport. So I don't know if this is a thing. I don't know if it's the genes that I was, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I did get searched. So, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, that's so funny, but oh, well, that's a great way to start, start things off. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> But comedy, you, you often say, uh, well, I've, I've read you uh, saying things like comedy helps uh, people deal with sort of tough or touchy subjects. And, and I guess that's quite a, I, I feel like as South Africans, we, we've got in our country, we have a pretty good sense of humor about laughing at ourselves as well, which is a, a good thing to have, I think. And um, but but how do you sort of find that you can sort of make, make a sort of a joke to make a situation seem or at least we can broach the subject then and, and sort of have a conversation you know, about it. It's, it's, it's not always easy. You know, the thing about comedy and, and the type of comedian I think that I am uh, and that I aspire to be, it really requires you to, to some extent, test boundaries. You know, and so the best comedians find a way to kind of walk right up to the line um, yeah. and, 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 and without somehow crossing it. Or even mm. if they do cross a line, they make you laugh so hard that you just are like, oh, oh, well, you know, uh, but I definitely I definitely have jokes that, you know, I think make people uh, a little uncomfortable and, and, and uh, you know, sometimes maybe even uh, makes it difficult for them to laugh just because they're like, oh, my God, that's he right. You know, that's, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I have a joke where I talk about how uh, after the last Summer Olympics, you know, they did the medal count, you know, and they kind of list all the countries and the sports and the different medals they got. Uh, and I was really surprised when they said that the United States only received one gold medal in the shooting events. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, if any sport, we should be dominating. I feel like we kind of have the whole shooting thing down uh, and so the question is who are they sending to the olympics right um uh, we wonder or i don't know but so 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 you know when you start kind of you know touching on things like mass shootings and things you know but for me it's it's i like finding clever ways to kind of really unpack or to criticize critique some of the kind of social things that are going on and cultural issues that are going on. Um, and, and when I can make people laugh about it while also learning something new, you know, I think that, you know, my whole background as an educator definitely plays into, you know, my comedic style and sensibilities. Yeah. Yeah. That's sure. so cool. I think it's such a cool way to kind of, like, like you said, maybe break, break the ice a little bit sometimes. Um, but also it's a good way to kind of, to get like a serious message across as well with a little bit of um with a little bit of humor. humor yeah i mean i like to really create the type of jokes that that what i call they they mess with people's schemas right yeah so you know every time someone goes through an airport metal detector now after hearing my joke <laughs> you know you're hoping for the yellow yeah you're hoping <laughs> guys yeah, the guys are hoping <laughs> that, 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 that they have to get searched there. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, I think it's it's those kind of things that, that uh, you know, really excite me, the possibility of really kind of in some ways altering people's reality and how they kind of see the world. And I think that's really what, you know, my whole belief about education really is about is, you know, I really believe that reading and education uh, really expand uh people's realm of possibility you know what they think is possible for themselves what they think is possible in the world um and 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 reading is, is such a kind of tremendously powerful tool in in kind of achieving that yeah absolutely a hundred percent like you know we're both big readers that's for sure i reckon i must have hundreds of unread books <laughs> but you know <laughs> um on my shelves but 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 who's like your inspiration when it comes to uh, c comedy well, you know, there's certain there's at least one person who I can no longer mention, uh, but uh, there uh. are still others. Uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Richard Pryor, uh, you know, I mean, he, he was a comedic genius. Uh, he did so much for comedy uh, and he was just brilliant. Um, you know, it, it's sad, but I mean, honestly, you know, Bill Cosby was 
you know, someone that 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 really I think influenced my comedy. Uh, you know, and it's unfortunate, kind of all the kind of new or recent developments around him that have really I think you know his legacy is, is shot and and deservingly so. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it's like you know, no matter how much good you've done when you when you do horrific and monstrous things, you know. It, there's no amount of good that can can really you know uh, you know kind of get rid of people's uh, pain and people's hurt, and so it's really unfortunate. Uh, but you know I think that it's it's uh, a, an awesome time in which we're living, where you know powerful people are are being uh, held accountable for their actions. You know so yeah. Uh, but but there's so many other comedians. You know I started doing stand-up comedy uh, when I moved to New York City. Uh, I moved here for grad school. I uh, studied education at a school called Bank Street College of Education and uh, started there in 2007. I uh, finished uh, my first master's in 2009 there. And uh, it, it was in 2009 that I started doing stand-up comedy uh, for the first time. And, uh, you know, it was really, uh, really, really great. Um, you know, I... There's so many people that I love watching uh, in terms of stand-up comedians uh, who the ordinary person either here in New York uh, or even uh, in in the country or outside of the country, they just wouldn't know because they, you know, haven't necessarily been in films or, or television. Mm, yeah. Uh, but, but I know them because, you know, I guess I came of age in terms of my comedy here in New York City. And so, you know, I guess my favorite comedian uh would be greer barnes, greer uh, he, barnes is, okay. he is someone I, I absolutely love to watch i think he's one of the funniest comedians on the planet and no comedian wants to follow follow greer barnes not a chris rock not a kevin hart no one wants to follow greer barnes you know i, I mean it's just I, yeah. I mean i never see a comedian just get a i mean he gets a standing ovation every single time and wow. he's like from the old school where he does the sound effects, he does the accents, <laughs> he does the impersonations, and his his humor <laughs> and his writing is so sharp and so uh, biting and 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 funny. And so I would say that you know uh, he's definitely one of the the kind of New York based comedians that I love uh, and who I've really kind of uh, aspired to kind of follow. And then Mike Yard, who was recently on Comedy Central's The Nightly Show. Uh, I, I kind of got a chance to kind of watch him as I was just starting out in comedy. Uh, and he uh, is just a, an amazing comedian and uh, a just outstanding host. You know, I, I watched him on numerous occasions, uh, you know, just host comedy shows where, you know, people from all over the world, because, you know, New York City is a, is a international and cosmopolitan type city where people come here as tourists and everything. And so, you know, one of the hard things about comedy is that in many ways, it's it's very kind of situated within, you know, specific cultures, you know. And so when you can see uh, someone make people from all over the world, different countries laugh at the same things, I think it's really a testament to uh, your 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 comedy. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that that is really the type of comedy that I really aspire to is the type of comedy that has you know, lots of universal elements to it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just going to say, like, um, you know, just to I think with with comedy, one of the whole things is uh, and Ricky Gervais, uh, you know, he often talks about this is like with with Bill Cosby, for example, you know, you have to separate the person from the comedy or the or the facts that happen. So I agree, like, obviously, the whole story around him is devastating, like the, just the whole the way of mistrust in people and what have you. I mean, you can talk a whole day about it, but you can also accept that his comedy was actually, he was funny. He was a funny guy. And, and it's too, in a way, it's, just, you know, like maybe in retrospect, it's not. I don't know. But in my mind, I also feel like there's a, a place to to find that at the time people were laughing at his jokes and stuff. And, and is that... Is it not right to to separate those, or do you feel it's like a, I mean, it's tainted I th everything? I think that um, one, at least in America, uh, there's very little tolerance for contradictions, especially when it comes to people of color. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we have slave owning presidents on our money all over the place. Mm-hmm. And they were raping black women up a storm. They're slaves, you know, but yet they have statues erected in their honor. They have money, you know, that, you know, ha- that, sh- you know, has their faces. And so, you know, I definitely think that, you know, in some ways, you know, th- there there are definitely situations and circumstances where there is a tolerance for, for, for contradictions, you know, people who did extraordinary things, uh, but who also, uh, did evil things, you know, and, and I think that, you know, depending on who the person is, our society, uh, may be a little bit more understanding or flexible in their willingness Mm. to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't know if they use that phrase, which sounds actually (laughs) kind of violent, uh, actually, now that I was like, we should be throwing babies anywhere, actually. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, his legacy is definitely tarnished forever. It really is. Mm. But at the same time, he made the careers of so many, mm. you know, actors and other people happen, right? And not because of him exploiting his power to do harm against them, but using his actual power or influence to give some uh, actors and other people uh, a leg up. And so, I mean, those things exist. The, you know, those people who have careers still have their careers, regardless of, of, of what Bill Cosby did. But I definitely think that, you know, it, it's just unfortunate. You know, it is. And I, and I think that, you know, you know I, I think it's, 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 uh, it's just interesting because, you know, as, as the kind of Me Too and other type of movements have kind of gained traction, uh, you know, it really has drawn attention that, uh, you know, I guess makes people wonder, like, what does forgiveness mean? What does it look like? What does justice mean? What does it look like? Um, and uh, I think that it it's kind of moving, you know, mm-hmm. uh, depending on who the person is, depending on what the circumstances are. But, you know, I'm a guy, uh, you know, I'm not a perfect guy. Uh, and, you know, I just, you know, want to be as best an advocate and ally as I can, you know, as I go through life for mm. uh, women. Um, but it's these things are not easy. And, you know, especially mm. as a comedian, you know, when, you know, someone that you really uh, admired and look up to, uh, you know, kind of have such a great fall, it, it's, it definitely does make you sad. You know, it, I mean, yeah. it, it just does, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I totally know what you mean. Like, um, I feel... I, I do feel like I maybe look at him, you know, that, that little bit differently now because we, we grew up in South Africa with the Cosby show, like I guess is probably most Yo, of the world. Everybody true. We, yeah. Everybody grew up with, you know, Dr. Huxtable, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly, but exactly. And you used to love it. It was just so fun. It was like a Monday night or something like that. And, um, you know, is it like, you know, before we move on, is it like too early to start pulling out the, the, um, the Mr. Cosby jokes, like, do you know, is, is that, is there a time when it starts? Uh, or have, you, have you, have you vented I mean, there yet? No, I mean, I have a joke. I have a joke. Uh, you know, I had to get my wisdom teeth out, uh, recently. Uh, and they gave me like, uh, this kind of IV or something that allowed me to kind of sedated me. Like I could go to sleep and then I just wake up and my teeth are out. But what they didn't tell me is about the side effects, like strange dreams, so I have this weird dream where I wake up in my dream. I'm still sleeping, but I wake up in the dream and I'm in the dentist chair, except it's not my dentist. It's Bill Cosby. <laughs> and he keeps insisting that I go to sleep. And I'm, just, <laughs> and I'm just like, no, I am not going to sleep. He's like, but if you do not go to sleep, it's going to be very painful for you. And I'm like, well, this is going to have to hurt because I need to keep my eyes on you, Dr. <laughs> but anyway, but I mean, listen, uh, you know, comedy comedians are about pushing boundaries, about, uh, you know, testing the boundaries. And no matter what you say, there's going to, you know, always be someone who probably doesn't like what you say or the way you say it. The trick is to be funny, honestly. Because the stuff that Richard Pryor talked about, I mean, he was very abusive to women. He was abusive to himself. He was abused, right? There's so much hurt, you know, that that yeah, I think 
finds its way onto comedy stages. Uh, and, you know, I feel that, you know, there are some comedians today who are just trying to shock people just for the sake of shocking someone, mm. you know, without having any point, without even having the funny, you know. And so I feel that the more controversial or edgy, you know, something is, the bigger your responsibility is as a comedian to make it funny. Mm. For sure. Definitely. I think what um, what, what you mentioned earlier, uh, just uh, just dwelling a little bit longer on, on comedy, is that you know some comedians are really funny internationally, and I think that is an amazing skill to have. However, I think it's also a testament to the fact that we, human beings are all more or less the same on some level. There, there's stuff that we can, you know, all explore and have a laugh at in any culture and any. And that's why it's so cool because you can, you know, you you might be grown up in 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 New York, for example, and I'm from South Africa, but there will be something that we can still both laugh about, uh, and because we've all done it or we've done silly things or whatever it is, and uh, and I think that's why comedy is so great is to as a linking between there's like a bridge between um, two cultures you can that you can find that common ground, and I think. Like Trevor Noah, I presume you've you've heard of him. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've so, actually been to the show. Yeah? Oh, oh cool. Abby, cool. Uh, how was that? Oh, it was great. Uh, I have a good friend of mine uh, uh, who uh, uh, Angelo Lazada. He's actually the warm up uh, comic for the show. So every before oh, wow. every show starts, he's the one that comes out and kind of talks to the crowd, gets them laughing, and gets them excited about the show, makes them clap. You know all oh, that jazz, cool. uh, and so he's he's really cool. He actually has been on the road with Trevor Noah quite a bit uh, since wow. uh, starting with the show, uh, and uh, so yeah, it it was a really cool experience. You know, Trevor is, is a brilliant guy, and most comedians actually are nerds in some way or the other. You know, some <laughs> of them are nerds about their content. You know, so they're you know reading everything, or they're nerds about the way they observe people. Or, or some comedians, you know, even if they're physical comedians, they're nerds about, you know, paying very close attention to their bodies <laughs> or their facial expressions, you know, doing like like when I, I think of Jim Carrey, you know, Jim he Carrey, used to literally yeah. just stand in front of the mirror and distort his face until he could, you know, really capture the essence of someone he was trying to really impersonate. And so, you know. Regardless of whether you're talking about politics or you're talking about culture or whatever, I definitely think that it takes some level of nerdiness to be able to uh, really refine your craft as a comedian to the point that you can make people you just do not know laugh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Wow, this got deep. I didn't... <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize... I didn't realize you know, I thought we were just gonna be talking about you know helping the babies read and stuff. And it, got, <laughs> it got real deep. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, so yeah, um, I would obviously, uh, we obviously want to get to know you, and and we we're getting there pretty quickly, which is awesome. <laughs> but um, give us a little bit of a rundown of like your childhood and 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 your sort of upbringing and how you got to reading and that kind of thing and um and just give us a little bit of a background on who who, who alvin irby is as a kid sure so uh you know i i was born and raised in little rock arkansas uh and you know my mom was a, a single mom you know she's an elementary school teacher uh you know reading really wasn't a part of my uh or i was it wasn't a significant part of my childhood you know i really didn't read for fun a lot of my friends, uh, you know, and, you know, brother and sister, you know, you know, none of us were kind of, you know, kind of tucked away in a corner somewhere, you know, reading for fun. You know, I was outside playing, you know, football in the street or basketball in the street or we were riding our bikes or we were playing Monopoly or my <laughs> mom or my mom thought we were playing Monopoly. We actually, <laughs> like, I, we actually were gambling half the time. Like, we would, have the, we would have the real money under the Monopoly board. And then when my mom would show up, we would just be like boardwalk, right? We would just, like, move the pieces and act like we were actually playing the game. Um, uh, but, but you know, I, I mean, I had, a, I had a good childhood. You know, I, I, I definitely, 
um, feel very fortunate to have, uh, you know, had a really cool group of friends in the neighborhood and we went on all types of fun adventures. Um, but, you know, I wonder, you know, ha had reading been a, a bigger part of my family or, or, or even my friendship circle, I, I, I think I possibly could have been that kind of kid who would have just been like sitting inside the house reading books all day. And so as much as I know how important reading is for everybody, I also am thankful for all the experiences I've had in life because I really believe that they collectively have made me kind of who I am. Um, mm. You know, my dad wasn't really in the picture, but recently, you know, I was just thinking back to the fact that he was a barber and a barbershop mm. owner. Mm. And I never even, I mean, I really <laughs> hadn't thought about it because, you know, I mean, he he was he left when I was like four or so, and so he wasn't really in the picture. Uh, but some of my very first memories of of him and interacting with him was, you know, going to his barber shop and sitting in his barber chair. And you know, I just wonder, like, you never know how years and years later those kinds of things being in your subconscious could mm. influence your perspective. You know, like, would I have? You know, I know I was a teacher. I know I was sitting in a barber shop when one of my students came into the barbershop and I got the idea for barbershop books. But if my father wasn't a barber and a barbershop owner, would I still in that moment yeah. came to that? I don't know. I probably would have, but I don't know. And so, you know, I do wonder, like, you never know how, mm. you know, the experiences that you have kind of fit together to really kind of carve out your path. You know, and I mm -hmm. think that as much as we have agency, I also think that, you know, there are things that happen in life that can, you know, really shape who we become and, and what path we take. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and at what point did your dad come back into your life? I wouldn't say that he has, actually. Okay. Uh, he's alive, but, mm. you know, he just really, you know, and it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, it's uh, unfortunate. But uh, I guess, you know, to some extent it is what it is. And, you know, I think that, you know, part of why Barbershop Books um, is such a powerful idea is partly because so many young black boys are raised by, by single mothers in the United States. So, you know, one of the things that Barbershop Books, you know, which for those of you who are listening who may not have, uh, you know, heard of this program, you know, what it does is, you know, we create child-friendly reading spaces in barber shops, uh, and we provide early literacy training uh, to barbers. And the, the mission is to help young black boys and other boys uh, of color to really identify as readers. You know, so many people, you know, when I tell them about reading and things like that, they're like, yeah, we want kids to, to uh, have a love of reading. And what I tell people is, well, a child can fall in and out of love with reading, depending on who their teacher is, depending on what reading material they may have access to, depending on what kind of homework they have. And so I'm less interested in them just loving reading and more of them identifying as a reader. Because if you are identifying in a certain way, right, then it's a lot more constant. It's a lot mm -hmm. more kind of uh, permanent, right? Uh, and so, you know, my goal is, you know, in the work that I do with Barbershop Books and in the work that I do traveling around the country talking to educators is, you know, challenging people to think about how we can begin to create the type of early positive reading experiences that will help, you know, children identify as readers. Yeah, I think it's such an important, uh, important uh, mission that you're on you know and like such a great uh, purpose that you that you're leading like at what what points in your life did did reading actually become something for you so you know i talk about this briefly in uh my recent ted talk um but you know i in high school i was in regular english class and i was in a regular english class um and you know, pretty much at my high school, they kind of organized people according to, you know, their perceived ability or whatever. And so I was in this class and I was so bored out of my mind. Like, you know, it was just, 
we were doing short stories and doing spelling tests in 10th grade. And I remember going to my counselor and just saying, hey, you know, is there any other class, you know, that I could, you know, get into? You know, I'm, I'm bored out of my mind here. And, uh, you know, I switched into another class and um, they were reading novels and writing book reports. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, whoa, why is there such a big difference? and expectations and rigor between these two classes. And then the second question that popped into my head when I walked into this new class was where did all these white people come from? <laughs> because in my regular class, it was all black pretty much and a few Latinos. And then in this advanced class, there were white students everywhere. And so, you know, I began to kind of really become curious about why kind of the kind of these classes kind of fell along these racial lines. And, you know, I didn't have the language to be able to talk about institutionalized racism and that sort of thing at the time. But, you know, I think that it was kind of some of the experiences like this that really inspired me uh, to one, began to take agency in terms of being in control of my education uh, and my reading, you know, and it was. I think that, you know, that was really the beginning of it for me is when I began to really understand that there was kind of some kind of more insidious something at play in terms of who was actually being challenged and, and provided with, you know, rigor and, and, and reading and, and who wasn't, you know. And, you know, I just decided, you know, I'm not going to let other people kind of dictate when and what I learn or when and what I read. Uh, and, and that really, I think, was, was really the beginning of, of a lot of, you know, the work that I'm doing now. Uh, and during my uh, junior year, I did a science fair project where I surveyed about, you know, 200 of my classmates to find out, you know, what their reading habits were. And what I found is that most of the students uh, didn't read at all if it wasn't required. And wow. so I decided I was going to create a reading incentive program for my high school. <laughs> and so I uh, designed a reading program and wrote a grant and uh, applied to the Barnes and Nobles in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And the community relations manager there gave me, uh, uh, awarded me an $810 grant to implement a reading incentive program at my high school. And, you know, I didn't think of myself as a literacy advocate and I had no interest whatsoever in going into education. Matter of fact, my high school principal one day during my senior year after school, he looked at me and said, you know, Alvin, you're going to be a better principal than I ever was. Hmm. And I looked at him and I said, never, I will never go into education. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, you know, I guess when I look back at things like that, I realize that I've really been on this path for a long time. Yeah, for hmm. sure. So, so who, who was like your, your sounding board when you had this kind of realization that yes, these sort of white kids are getting uh, this certain type of education and we're not, uh, you know, did you have anyone to speak to about it? I mean, I, I ran for student council president and, you know, at my high school, you had to, in order to vote during the kind of school elections, you had to be registered. And so everybody from my neighborhood I like, they all came out and registered to vote so they could vote for me. And everybody was happy. They're like, Alvin, you're the first black president. And I'm like, no, <laughs> our high school has had other black presidents, but they didn't care. And I was, you know, running on this whole platform of I'm going to create a reading incentive program. None of them cared about it at all, honestly. <laughs> they were just happy to see someone that they knew running for student government at our high school. And, you know, of course, this was you know, you know, pro more than, uh, yeah, this was way before Obama, you know, we're talking 2002, 2003. Uh, but I definitely think that if he would have been around, you know, you know, pe you know, I definitely would have been like, uh, I believe, uh, in change. Uh, uh, we can do it. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, oh. but, but but anyway, so I, I mean, 
you know, I did this this thing. I was a student council president. We implemented this reading incentive program in my high school. And uh, I think one of the most powerful things it taught me was the power of my own ideas. You know, there's so many people walking around convinced that they have nothing to offer the world, that they have no gift, skill, or talent. And, you know, I just do not believe that. And I think that what has happened is that far too many people have spent so a lot of time focused on their deficits or what they perceive to be deficits instead of thinking about and focusing on their strengths and their assets. And so what creating this reading incentive program did for me in terms of being able to see an idea I had go from just idea to something real, and not just real, but something that was inspirational and inspired other people to get involved. I mean, that really changed something for me. It really, uh, I think, uh, caused me to, to really expand my realm of possibility in terms of what's possible for myself and what was possible for my life. And far too many people haven't had experiences that have convinced them that they actually can change the world. They actually can make a difference no matter how big or small. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. I, I think aside from that experience, one of the most, you know, since we're talking about, you know, me growing up and what are the things that kind of influenced me, aside from that uh, reading incentive program and becoming student council president and all of that, uh, one of the things that I feel like has had a tremendous impact on my life has been crocheting. Uh, you know, I've been crocheting uh, for, uh, you know, like, I don't know, man. It's It's been, what, 27 years now? Or so, like 26 years I've been crocheting. Wow. And so I've been crocheting. Master cro I was like, <laughs> yeah, my crochet game is crazy. But um, <laughs> since I was like seven, and you know, you know, in Little Rock, Arkansas, that's really not something uh, <laughs> a little boy does. It's just <laughs> going anywhere, really. I don't, I don't know anywhere that there's like little boys just crocheting. <laughs> but, but what it taught me was to appreciate my own unique gifts, skills, and talents, and those of others. And it also, I, I would say, created, you know, self confidence. And, uh, and and not just you know blanket self confidence, but the type of self confidence that convinced me to not stop doing something that I felt I should be doing or that I felt I was good at. You know, because you know I'm not going to say I don't care what people think or I didn't care what people thought because that's not true. When people said crazy stuff to me when they saw me crocheting in the middle of a basketball game. But, <laughs> but, but what it did is it taught me not to care enough about what people thought to stop doing something, yeah. you know, that I really felt uh, I, was, I was kind of supposed to be doing. So, yeah, crocheting for sure, definitely, I think, I would say, has played a role in, in who I am and kind of... Yeah, who I've become. Can we can we maybe just like explore that a little bit? Like, can you tell us what sort of things you like you you have been crocheting? How did you even get into it? Was it through your mom? Like, and and yeah, then, my mom. What my mom did talking. your buddies say? You know, like they must have <laughs> ripped mom. you. I can imagine. Oh you know? yeah, no, I've heard just about anything you can imagine. Uh, and that's if you actually just you know YouTube me. Uh, you know, Alvin Irby crocheting. You can see footage of me crocheting on the subway here in New York City. Cool. And you can see from the footage the looks, you know, <laughs> that, that I get, you know, <laughs> on the train and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, you know, people said crazy stuff. People gave me crazy looks. You know, what are you doing? Are you gay? Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, for sure I got a lot of that. Uh, but I also got some, man, that's cool. Wow, you're doing that fast. I want to learn how to do that. You know, I also got that. Uh, my mom taught me, you know, when I was about seven. You know, my grandmother, you know, she doesn't know how to crochet, but I did crochet her a blanket. You know, I crochet stuff. I mean, I've made all kinds of stuff over the years. I mean, hats, you know, scars, blankets, afghans, uh, iPod holders when iPods Ooh. were a thing. Cool, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, pot holders. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've just done a lot of stuff. And I've taught a ton of people how to crochet. 
you know, when every year that I taught, when I taught kindergarten, when I taught first grade, when I taught fourth grade, I uh, always taught students to crochet. Uh, you know, and so that was a pretty cool thing to be able to share that with students as well. Yeah, but you know what? I, I, I absolutely love it. And um, my girlfriend and I were recently in Brazil. She's Brazilian and... Uh, her mom has like some great like little rags and things like that. And she's like, yeah, no worries. You want one like that? I'll do it for you. No problem. So she just uh, like literally got a picture of this this cool flower. And like within the um, space of like a week, she made us this amazing like crocheted yeah. uh, rag. You know what I mean? And I, I'm like, that is a real talent. Like you have to be... Like well, it's, I'm great to hear um, yeah. that that is uh, still happening because, you know, with the advent of technology and all this other stuff, you know, certain things like that definitely aren't being passed down as much, you know. Um, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Hey? And you yeah. know what's so, so classic is like today. Wait, I was... does your girlfriend crochet? No, she doesn't, but no. See, um, exactly. I, yeah, yeah. Yo, I have never talked to her. Yo, but... y'all gonna have to have a crochet party, like yeah. with her mom. <laughs> Actually, you're right. We'll, we'll get her over. We'll like hook a... up a scarf like this. Yeah, and you'll be like, say, hey, then yeah. what? Well, what I do guess we do? they don't need scarves in Brazil, though, right? Like, yeah, does it no. get cold enough? No, it doesn't. No, exactly, it yeah. <laughs> but um, but actually, I was having a chat to my mom today, and she was like, she's like, yeah, no, I'm going to go and do my knitting this afternoon because I really, like, I enjoy my knitting. It's very therapeutic. And I'm like, that's cool. Like, it's a cool thing to do. You know what I mean? It's like you have a bit of time to yourself. You focus on you, your wool, and your needles. And it's a good thing yeah, to do. Man. It's good for your mind. Meditation. It's good for your soul. Oh, I got so many crochet needles and yarn, man. I could just make it rain. You know, like <laughs> you know how the guys are with the money and the clubs. Like I could make it rain. Just <laughs> crochet needles and, and yarn everywhere. Uh, uh, that's awesome. classic, man. So why can't why are we oh. not seeing any on your walls behind you? Like any cool, you know, crocheted yeah, things. Uh, <laughs> No, nah, it's not exactly the kind of thing you would put on a wall. Just, But I do have lots of scarves, though. You know, when it gets cold, uh, and it definitely gets cold here in New York City, I definitely have tons of, of warm scarves that I, I can choose from. <laughs> do you ever, so like, cool. uh, make some for some mates or family? Oh, and you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I first came happy to New birthday. York, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As soon as I – the first year I came to New York and I was on the subway, you know, commuting and everything, I would usually be crocheting. So that – after that first year, I pretty much made a scarf for just about everybody. You know, my mom, my brother, my sister, you know, my roommate, <laughs> everybody kind of got the, got a scarf. <laughs> uh, oh, and I wanted to just go briefly back to what you mentioned about feeling empowered to to be great and do things that you love and, and what you do. And I, I think um, it's just interesting how finding that inspiration, I suppose, a lot of the time can come from reading. Um, and, and and from books because you, you you know you read about other people's stories. But what I actually wanted to ask really more is about what is this term identify as a reader? What is that? I think it's quite an interesting term, an interesting way to put it. And I'd like to just explore that a little bit more. So, what does that mean, and what is the implication of it? Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I really, until I started saying it, I I really haven't heard anyone using it. Educators professors, no one, you know, most of the conversation around helping kids to read is usually around, you know, improving their literacy or improving their reading skills or their love of reading or these kind of things. But, you know, I, I, the more and more I've spent time thinking about and, and working with children, the more and more convinced I am that many children do not identify as readers. Uh, and when I say identify as readers, what I mean is, uh, if you ask them, they would say, I'm a reader, right? I mean, essentially, that's, that's essentially what mm. I mean. Uh, the same way, you know, someone might ask, you know, you know, where are you from? Or, you know, and you would mm. say, oh, well, I'm South African, right? Mm. And I don't, I don't know what it means to be a South African. You know, I mean, part of it means you have that accent you guys have. But, <laughs> uh, but other than that, you know, I don't, I really don't know. But it means something to you if you are uh, if you feel strongly enough to identify in that way. And mm. so the same way in which for you, you know, 
it might mean that, you know, you have some kind of shared culture, right? Some shared holidays, some shared history, some shared, uh, you know, pain, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, whatever it is that, that it means to be a South uh, African. Well, to be a reader, I think there are certain things that people share, right? If you tell someone I'm a reader and someone says I'm a reader too, well, immediately mm. there's an assumption that you, one, you read for pleasure, right? It's not something that you're forced to do. Two, that you probably buy books or you check them out regularly, right? Uh, and that you probably share book recommendations with other people and you welcome books as gifts. Yeah. Those yes, sir. Cool. characteristics as a whole, I think, you know, uh, might be some of the characteristics that, you know, mm. might describe someone who identifies as a reader. But for me, you know, what's just so tremendously ironic about American education is that, you know, the children who tend not to identify as readers are often the children who have very few reading opportunities outside of school, who have few uh, opportunities to kind of interact with books. Or, you know, they have limited access to books outside of school uh, and who tend to struggle in reading, you know. Uh, and these are the kids who tend not to identify as readers. They tend not to have relevant reading models, meaning, you know, they don't have people in their immediate environment who's modeling, you know, pleasure reading and things like that. And so when they get to school, for a lot of young kids, the first thing that happens is that they're being assessed. Yeah. And someone's telling them all the words they don't know all the letters they don't know, all the letter sounds they don't know. And could you imagine if you went to work <laughs> and, and what happened every day was someone just telling you a list of all the things you didn't know how to do, all the things you, you, you can't do, you don't know. I mean, imagine how you would feel yeah. if that was what your education consisted of. And so for a lot of kids, I think they're finding themselves at a crossroad where they're at a very young age, having to decide or making a decision about to what extent they're going to identify with the, with school and those things that are associated with school, whether that be reading, learning, or uh, writing, or doing math, or whatever. And a lot of kids are choosing to not identify with school mm. or with learning. And, what's, and, and what I was going to say in terms of the ironic part of this is that the kids who don't have access to books and reading and, and positive reading experiences out of school, they're the ones who need fun reading experiences in school the most yeah. because they don't have parents who are taking them to the bookstore or who are regularly taking them to the library yeah. or reading to them at night. So their reading identity is being shaped or not shaped in school. And so if all of their reading experiences are shaped around how much they struggle in reading, we really shouldn't be surprised that so many kids are like, you know what, actually, I don't like to read. Reading isn't for me, you know. And so I would say that, you know, schools should be doing a lot more to make reading fun, to make it relevant, and to make it engaging, especially for the kids who don't have fun reading experiences outside of school. But... Mm -hmm. This is the thing. The kids who love to read, the kids who identify as readers, it's often not because of school. It's often because they're having positive reading experiences outside of school that are countering the mm. negative or traumatic reading wow. experiences that they're having in school. Yeah. I, I'm just I'm just wondering, is there any like research or anything around reading, say, like if your parents read to you, you know, before you went to sleep? that you oh, yes. you basically oh, yes. are going to be a reader or yeah absolutely i mean there's research that was done in 21 countries around uh books in the home and they found that literally just the number of books in the home led to higher uh levels of educational attainment hmm. just wow. the just the number of books doesn't even it, they they control for the types of books just the number of books and their theory was that if promoted a kind of uh, a, a kind of academic culture or something in the home. But the thing is, it's like, but there are kids who literally don't have any books at home. Okay. Like none. Nice. And, and, and you, for yourself, did you have many books at home? I mean, my mom had the Bible and she had, you know, a number of books 
around, you know, education books and other types of books. But she really didn't read. I didn't see her reading a lot for pleasure other than the Bible. You okay. know, the Bible mm -hmm. was the main kind of thing. But but some kids don't even see their parents reading that. <laughs> like, you know, you know, <laughs> and, and my mom definitely emphasized that reading was important, you know, but, you know, it wasn't her snuggling up with us and reading a book. Uh, it was more her forcing me to come inside from playing to do reading lessons, which mm. if you can imagine, didn't exactly <laughs> make me excited about reading as a kid. <laughs> and, and what Stop about crocheting you? crocheting and come and read. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and what about your brothers and sisters? What are, you know, what did they enjoy reading? Were they like scholars or what, what were you? No, nah, no, nah, no, no. I, I, you know, my, my sister, uh, you know, she's right now in training to be a, a police officer. Uh, she used to be a, a correctional officer at our local, um, uh, kind of county jail. Uh, and then, you know, my brother, uh, works for, uh, the local, uh, gas company, uh, you know, reading meters and stuff, uh, you know, back in, and they're both back in, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. You know, I'm kind of the only one that kind of, you know, left, yeah. Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Roguish. Yeah. That, that's cool. <laughs> and, and, and um, so, so you obviously had like a, this sort of inkling uh, towards reading, like when you, when you were in school, but do you, I know you, you trained to be a teacher as well. D yeah, did, I did. Did you, and I think you said you were kindergarten and like grade four. Uh, did, did that then really sort of, um, get your interest more in like, right, I need to help kids um, to, to read because you noticed like it was a big issue? You know, I mean, I literally, in terms of this whole barbershop books, you know, organization, I mean, I was literally sitting in a barbershop across the street from the school where I taught first grade in the Bronx. And I was getting a haircut. And one of my first grade students walked into the barbershop plopped down on the couch and just stared out the window for 15 or 20 minutes. And he was my student <laughs> and I knew his reading level. So the whole time I was looking at him, all I kept thinking was he should be practicing his reading right now. And I wished I had a children's book to give him, but I didn't. But it was kind of the, a perfect storm in terms of me being a teacher, you know, a kindergarten teacher, a first grade teacher. At that time, I was a first grade teacher. Uh, me being a black male and understanding the kind of cultural significance of the barbershop. You know, barbershops in America are one of the few places left in black communities where people from different socioeconomic levels uh, interact. Because if you have good health insurance, uh, you don't go to the same dentist or doctor as someone who, uh, you know, may have some type of government uh, funded health care. Mm -hmm. But that's not true of the barbershop. There are CEOs and executives and other people who go to the exact same barbershop as, you know, the taxi driver or the teacher mm -hmm. or whoever, uh, because you got to get your hair cut, you know, and whoever's the best, that's where you want to go. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I think that that definitely creates a, a kind of interesting dynamic. Also, you know, it's a male centered space, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people approach me saying, you know, why not beauty shops? Why not laundromats? Why not churches? Why not all these other places where little boys might be waiting. And the, and the thing that I tell them is that our program is focused on helping, you know, young black boys and other boys of color to really identify as readers by connecting reading to a male centered space and by mm. involving men and in boys early reading experiences. And so the barbershop is really just an ideal place for that type of uh, experience to happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's a, uh, I mean, you you've got to start somewhere, and and I think linking those two with a cult with a real cultural uh, identity, like a like a barbershop, is really smart. So, so now t tell us a little bit more about the actual your program um, specifically, and, and what is your goal, and and with it, and and give us a bit of background on how it all came to be specifically. Uh, and when you actually started the whole thing. So, you know, I had the idea and uh, it all kind of, I, I founded an organization called Reading Holiday Project uh, to do this work of putting uh, reading spaces in barbershops. And I, I kind of came up with the name because when I was in London, when I was, when I was living in London uh, and I was uh, 
kind of uh, doing an internship uh, in Greenwich at the Greenwich Attendance Advisory mm-hmm. Service, you know, we were uh, <laughs> we were pretty much riding around in a van with these social workers and these cops. And uh, when they would see a kid who, who was uh, skipping school or, uh, you know, they would say, there's one bunking off. And like, which I guess bunking <laughs> off in, in <laughs> London meant that you were skipping school or missing school. And so uh, literally they would like zoom out in front of the kid, hop out of the van on them and say, why aren't you in school? And get them in the van and then take them to school. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. But I remember asking the director of this uh, attendance advisory service, like, you know, what is the, you know, what's the number one reason so many kids, you know, are not going to school or whatever. And he said unauthorized holidays. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the word holiday used to describe a vacation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Because here in America, they just say I'm going on vacation. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so when I came up with the idea for, you know, putting books in barbershops, I said, you know, I want kids to take a little reading holiday, (laughs) uh, a little, a little break to read a book. But then I realized that, you know, you can't really do stuff that clever. I think in America sometimes, like you just got to make things very (laughs) clear and plain and not be so clever. I mean, look where our president is, but anyway, uh, so, (laughs) So I I was like, you know, this is a horrible name for, you know, the work that I'm actually doing. And so I took some time and kind of thought up a new name, and that name was Barbershop Books. And so, you know, Reading Holiday Project is still the name of the organization, but Barbershop Books is the name of the program. Uh, And so, you know, it really started with uh, me getting a a recommendation from a friend to... to, uh, you know, work with a barbershop in Harlem called uh, Denny Moe's Superstar Barbershop. And I went in one day and just had a conversation, explained what I was thinking about doing. He thought it was a good idea. Uh, I went into the barbershop with a handful of books, ranging from picture books for small children all the way up through novels. And I just kind of sat them on the table and just sat for hours and hours at a time just observing, you know, looking to see what would happen. And what I noticed was that the older kids, uh, the teenagers, the adults, were not engaging with the books very often. You know, they were on their cell phones or they were watching TV or they were having conversations. But the little children, right, mm. the children who were, you know, two, three, four, five, they were the ones mm. who were most likely to actually engage with books in the barbershop. And so that allowed me to kind of refocus uh, the direction of the program Um, And I was buying, you know, the books myself with my own money at the time. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that if I was going to invest money in in a program that I wanted to ensure that I was going to have the largest social return on investment. Right. So if I spent money on books, I wanted to buy the books that were going to get read the most. And so it was like, you know, as a result of those observations that I decided to focus the program um, solely on children ages four to eight. Um, and so I put the first bookshelf in Denny Moe's, uh, and then we spread to about 10 other barbershops in, um, in Harlem. And then, you know, I developed some strategic partnerships with publishers and with manufacturers of the bookshelves. And now we have reading spaces in about, uh, 112 barbershops across 28 wow. states, uh, wow. and 18 cities. Uh, I'm sorry. 28 uh, cities and 18 states. I said that reverse, I think, uh, here in New York City. And so, you know, it's been really great, you know, to just see, you know, the attention, the interest. And uh, and those are just the barbershops that are participating in our program. There's also been kind of a kind of national movement, you know, that we've sparked of That's cool. barbers, libraries, school districts who are implementing their own version. Cool, man. Not with not with our name, you know, because we'll have to send them a cease and desist. But, you know, but, <laughs> but just a similar you know, version. And so and the reality is, you know, barbershop books, you know, won't be we won't be able to make it to every single barbershop alone. And so, you know, I'm just happy to see that there are more people being civically engaged as it relates to, you know, supporting and promoting early literacy in the communities. Uh, and people who are really thinking more. And, you know, I hope 
that you know the work that barbershop books is doing the work that i'm doing will really uh cause people to to think a lot more intentionally and carefully about the type of reading experiences that we're creating for children but firstly i think yeah. it's like such an, a, a remarkable initiative that you're doing so congratulations for that and it's Thanks. it's, it's re you. really sure. really great and um so what uh, what sort of books are you putting out for these guys and and what's the feedback like as well well so you know the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive uh the books that we are uh and that's barbers that's parents as barbershop owners um the books are books that were recommended by young black boys you know we i asked boys in barbershops you know what are some of the books that you really like um and you know they said you know books like Captain Underpants, you know, books like <laughs> um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, books like No David, you know, these are some of the most engaging and, and, and popular books, you know, and, you know, I find myself often having to really counter some of these very uh, negative perceptions that I think don't support uh, the positive early literacy development. What I mean is, you know, when people hear, oh, you know, your program is helping black boys or, oh, you're putting, you know, these reading spaces in barbershops and, and, and low income communities. Well, I have some books uh, that I would love to donate. And they often are wanting to clear out their basements or their attics <laughs> of some random old books. And they have this idea that somehow if a kid has limited access to books or maybe don't like doesn't like reading, then any books are better than no books. <laughs> and I, I mean, I categorically uh, oppose that line of thinking, uh, and I believe, and in, in, in Barbershop Books, you know, uh, believes that, you know, limited access to books and, and, and not necessarily identifying as a reader or liking reading is not a reason to be less selective, but if anything, that's a reason to be more selective. Mm. Yeah, but it's still it's still a nice thought, though, you know, like people wanting to give their books. But you know what, yeah. though? Nice thoughts don't help kids read. It just makes you feel better. And I feel that so much of what's going on in the world right now is really about people getting warm and fuzzies and feeling good on the mm -hmm. inside and less about whether or not their actions are actually resulting in people's lives being better. Yeah, yeah, that's good a good point. Call. Yeah. Yeah. But I do appreciate people's sentiments. I don't want to. I don't want y'all to yeah. think I'm walking well, around. Well, this is a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yelling at, at people or anything like that. But I tell people, that, you know, don't go out and buy a new book at retail value. Donate to Barbershop Books so that we can get ten books for twenty dollars. Yeah. Right. As opposed to you getting two books for ten dollars. You know. You know. You know, but but you know, some people are just you know more. They, I mean, there really are people who are more interested in just feeling good. They really are right. than whether or not they're actually achieving uh, a particular result. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. I think it's it's really common across the board. I guess if you just uh, you, you, it, different kinds of charities and stuff, and and peop, things that you think you can do. Oh, let me. This will be great because you know this makes sense to me. But when you look at the research of things, like you say, the, the the actual numbers are very different often. So it is important to take a deeper dive if you're going to decide to support something and and see if it actually makes a difference. You know? Well, and I get so many. I mean, I I get requests from people in London and in Australia and other places saying, "Yo, I think you know this will work in our in our country." Or you know, you should bring barbershop books here. We have all these barbershops. But, you know, honestly, I'm trying to build our capacity <laughs> so that we can have a staff to continue to grow uh, and deepen our impact here uh, just in the, you know, in the United States. But, you know, I definitely look forward to being able to, you know, really, uh, you know, expand our reach. Um, but, you know, our work right now, I think, is, is really on securing, you know, uh, fun, uh, funds, you know, funders and uh, identifying, you know, potential board members and just a lot of the nitty gritty stuff that you need to kind of really, uh, you know, bring a, a, an idea like this to scale. Mm. So have, have you noticed like, or is there once again, any research on the type of books that young black guys might like as opposed to young white uh, guys might like? 
Like, no, I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't, I don't, not, or I don't know of any. It could be. I know that Scholastic did a, uh, they do a, a kind of parent and student survey uh, every few years where they survey thousands and thousands of children and, and ask them. And one of the things that they found in their survey when they ask kids, kind of what kinds of, what do they look for when choosing a book? The number one thing that children said they look for when choosing a book was a book that would make them laugh. Yeah, mm, cool. And I don't think that that's something that is, you know, particular to any one uh, group of students, you know, whether it's black students or Latino students or white students, you know, or, or even just boys or girls. But I will say that, you know, I, I as a teacher, found laughter and humor to definitely be uh, uh, very engaging for, for young children and, you know, we're just really trying to bring the books that the kids have told us that they want. You know, when I talk to adults, they have all these ideas about the type of books that kids should be reading or the types of books they want kids to be reading. And often there's a serious disconnect between mm. what adults want kids to read and what children actually want to read on their own. Yeah. So, so Alvin, is, that good? is it basically good enough for you to say, as long as my child is reading, it doesn't really matter at that age what they're reading. Is that fair to say? That is absolutely fair to say. And I, I encounter parents all the time who are like, oh, my God, you know, Mr. Irby, all my son wants to read are comic books. And I was like, I just want to stop you right there. I want to just draw some attention to your first few words. All my son wants to read. Yeah. I was like, mm. and I tell them, you know how many parents wish they could get they could say just those words about their son. Mm -hmm. All my son wants to read, <laughs> right? And so yeah. I explain to parents that, you know, your, your, your child's reading taste, you know, their reading interest will develop and mature and change over time. What's most important right now is that they identify as a reader. Yeah. Because if they don't identify as a reader now, the chances of them identifying as a reader later are just going to be greatly diminished. And if you don't identify as a reader, then the chances of you being a lifelong learner, yeah. you know, are greatly diminished, which mm. means that all types of opportunities uh, will be closed off to you. Because, you know, oh. the 21st century is really a knowledge-based economy. You know, the, the industrial age is dead. You know, uh, the, the factory jobs, that once could sustain a family and allow you to kind of uh, live a, a, a comfortable life, that's no longer the case anymore. And so, you know, as more and more of, you know, globalization happens and things like that affect, you know, especially the American economy, you know, your ability to read and your ability to, you know, uh, think critically and, 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 and kind mm -hmm. of learn information is, is just that much more important. Yeah, so I, true. I, I'm just wondering uh, if it's maybe just a South African book or not. But is, do you know a book called Adrian Mole? Have you ever heard of a it? Adrian Mole. I do not. Okay, wow. Well, I, do, I don't know, Craig. Do you remember Adrian Mole as a kid, like at all? Uh, the the name of the book or the the, the author? No, the name of the book. The, with the, the the little. Yeah, it was it was no. about like a guy. Like I'm sure he he wrote like a diary, like every single day. And, oh, no, I never uh, read that. Ne oh my word! Uh, well, it, it was one of the best books ever as a kid. I mean, I was really? my school always used to read Adrian Mole. Like, and it was this oh, wow. young was guy. Was it like, like a whole series? I I think there was like only two of them, but he literally wrote a diary like every single day. Um, well, the, di and the it was diary so books, good. The diary of a Wimpy Kid is like one of the hottest books out right <laughs> now. Uh, so. You know, that's that, cool. Yeah. The, I think that that guy was on to something. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what I'll do, because uh, we're actually going to be in New York in July, is I'll try to get a copy of it. And then when we come to New York, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll try what, and give you one. What time in July will you be around? Uh, in like, like in 22nd of July. July or something like that. Oh, okay. We're going to be having a summer book giveaway on July 18th. We're going to be giving away uh, over 3,000 books to children from across New York City. Um, so that should be cool. Uh, that's cool. Um, yeah, that sounds amazing. But, but yeah, you'll definitely have to, uh, well, if I'm, you know, performing or doing stand up or something, you'll have yeah. to come, uh, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. I, and I was, <laughs> I was just thinking like, 
you know, it, if the two tie up, so there surely has to be a Freddie, uh, sorry, Freddie, uh, uh, Eddie Murphy uh, sort of joke in there, you know, with um, him being, you know, coming to America, sitting in those barber shops, and uh, yeah. you know, obviously yeah. being a black comedian, I'm sure you must have, you know, you must have something there. Yeah, do I have any uh, jokes about barber shops? I do have a few jokes about uh, about the barber shop. It's more about traumatic experiences that I've <laughs> had in the barber shop. But I do have a, I do have a few stories. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention as we were kind of talking about book selection and the types of books that kids like. You know, I I recently uh, published my own children's book yeah. uh, called Gross Greg. You know, and it's a, a funny, you know, laugh out loud story about a little boy who loves to eat his boogers. Um, <laughs> you know, you call them boogers, but Greg calls them delicious little sugars. Uh, <laughs> <I love that. laughs> and, and, you know, it's just a really funny story uh, about this little kid who, you know, happens to be black, who, who just loves to eat his boogers. And of course, everyone else is. <laughs> completely disgusted and appalled <laughs> uh you know his teacher his sister his mother everybody's like oh my god stop it you know but he's just <laughs> loving uh the title gross greg and so um you know i published this book because of you know when i was teaching you know nearly all the children's books that had black characters were about slavery civil rights or biographies and it's just mm. like man like Black children should have the opportunity just to laugh and be silly and be children. Yeah, and that's the yeah. thing is too often, you know, little little black boys they don't get to be kids. You know, they're being treated like they're older than what they really are. They're being asked mm. to read books that are all serious. You know, and it's like you know, that's that's one of the things I think also that you know I've really tried to do with Gross Greg and with my work with Barbershop Books is really keep children's center you know uh, mm. and the and make sure that they really are the focal point of our work and you know because i think it's so easy to get lost in all this other stuff you know yeah, yeah absolutely i think it's having fun is so important and and like you say i could imagine as a uh, you mentioned you um before about a lot of um young black boys are actually being brought up by their mothers and and i'd imagine um, that there is a lot of pressure on them to to man up, I suppose, and 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 you know get Yo, there faster than these, they need to. I hear about these programs all the time. People want to, you know, because I work with barbershop books. They want to tell me they're like, oh, we have this great program in my school. You know, it's about boyhood, the manhood, you know, boyhood, the manhood, and all of this and that. And I'm just like, you know, but they're six, like, <laughs> <laughs> like. Yeah. Let them be a kid. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, and so, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of pressure because, you know, when you go out into the, the world, especially here in America, there's a very hostile. I mean, you all read the news. You know that black men yeah. are being shot down in the street by police unarmed. Yeah. You know, there's all this pressure to, you know, when you go out in public to, you know, not upset anyone, to not, you know, mm. to, you know, it's like. White kids get to be individuals. Like, no one mm. sees, you know, a little white kid and somehow he's now re representing all white kids today yeah. and forever. But somehow black kids, you know, they don't get to be individuals. They're somehow representing a whole group, a whole diverse group of people somehow. And it's unfortunate because in many ways it does rob kids of their childhood. Mm. You know, they're forced to have to think about things a lot of other kids just don't have to think about. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is quite sad. Um, but do you mind just uh, changing your, like, checking your camera quickly, if you don't mind? Oh, did I freeze again? My yeah, bad. no worries, man. All right. Hopefully, we should be back up so, and going. So, so while, while we, yeah, while we, yeah. So, so um, I'll just wait for Greg to appear quickly. Um. <laughs> So when I when mine goes crazy he and I yeah click this, off you know it's weird yeah but Scarf knows. is interesting yeah um, it is let's do one more there let's do it again oh man round two <laughs> seems to work better for a little while <laughs> we were good for a long time 
Yeah, it got tired. Skype just got tired. <laughs> yeah. It needs to eat its Wheaties. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, did y'all eat Wheaties in Aust- in uh, in South Africa? No, we didn't. Wait, is that like Wheat Bix? Or? No, no, it's not. It's, it's like a, it's I don't a... know. They used to have all these athletes on the cover. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Wheaties were horrible. They were they tasted horrible, <laughs> but, they, but they had famous athletes on the front, so you wanted to buy it because <laughs> you'd be you'd like, like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be like them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'd just like to just ask a question, right? You know. Why, why for you, like, do you feel like you sort of, you gravitate towards wanting to help kids, you know? Is it, is it something, I don't know, is it some realization in your life that why are you doing it? My mom was a teacher for more than 30 years in the Little Rock School District. Um, And so, you know, I don't think I could talk about this without probably talking about the influence she had on me, whether it was explicit or, or, or implicit, you know, but, you know, seeing her grading papers, going with her to her classroom to help put up her bulletin board, uh, all of these things I'm sure had an influence on me. And, and, you know, I worked in summer camps as a kid, you know, I was a camp counselor working with kids. So, you know, it's kind of like I've always, I just always been doing it. And, you know, it was when I was in uh, college during my second year of college that I took one education course and, that semester, I could barely sleep because my mind wouldn't turn off at night because all I kept thinking was about what I would do if I was a teacher, if I had a classroom. Mm. Uh, and it was kind of at that moment that I stopped running from what I now believe to be my calling, which is wow. to be an educator. Yeah. And, and then you certainly come across that way, but then I... I just have this great feeling like, you know, you're already having such an amazing influence and I'm sure yeah. it's just going to grow and grow and grow. And it just sounds like the, the, the cool thing that excites me is that like technology is not something that's going to displace a barbershop, you know, like those things are pretty much nah, always going to nah, be there, aren't there, they? There won't be any uh, robo barbers that I think black people <laughs> will trust with their hair. Yeah, yeah, I don't think anyone would, but yes, yeah, like, whoa, what? Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to shortcut there, but um, so yeah, just just kind of like moving on from that. Um, you've you've done this amazing TED talk, and I I've watched it a couple of times now, and it really brings out like a few things. It brings out, you know, obviously who you are, uh, what you're doing, and also just your sort of really fun side and your charismatic side, and also your you know your your great side as being a good orator. Um, what, and this has been viewed like just on the TED website like 800,000 times and I can imagine millions of other times somewhere else. So, you know, how, how did you sort of get invited to go on to TED and what did it feel like? Because it was actually at one of the main events and but, but in like one of the, the other rooms sort of thing. So, yeah, if you just tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so I, I applied to uh, be a TED resident. Um, at the suggestion of, of someone else who had gone through the TED residency program. And it's essentially uh, uh, a cohort. You know, they choose a small group of uh, individuals, innovators, uh, thinkers from around the world. And they essentially put us all in a, in a, in a huge office for 14 weeks. Uh, and they, uh, you know, give us space and, and, and opportunity and resources to work on our respective projects while also supporting us uh, in the uh, kind of preparation of a TED of a TED talk, wow. you know. So uh, all of the TED residents did a TED talk, but they chose a few that they put up on the TED.com website. Oh. And so I was really fortunate to have had my uh, you know talk selected. Um, yeah. But you know, it was a really really amazing experience to just be surrounded by so many amazing people. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity, um, you know, and, you know, I definitely have seen the positive impact of having, you know, had an opportunity to, to deliver a TED talk and to have it featured on the, uh, website. Yeah, it's really awesome. It's such an amazing platform, isn't it? And I heard someone speaking about TED talks as, uh, some, he was saying, it's like almost like some kind of a new scientific religion. You could imagine it because it's such an amazing event, you know, 
such good information. Um, but but it's also this uh, sort of in a weird way. It's it's um, strange because it's a, it's quite a pr privileged thing. But at the same time, the ideas that are coming around it are are really amazing. So uh, I think it's such an interesting space that and but well done. It was a really really great great chat. Um, I'd also thank, like to thank you. To, to find thank out, you very much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we move on from your book, I, I just I had to mention it because I, I really enjoyed the the illustrations in the book, and I, I really like. Um, oh, did you Craig's, order a copy? No, no, I've just looked at it online oh, and what okay. I've seen of it. Yeah, um, but the pictures look really beautiful, and they really like cleverly done because, like in Greg's room, there's like black like space travel and there's you can see it's like well really well thought out and and how did you come to the sort of artistic side of it and um and the illustrator tell us a little bit about him because it's quite interesting yeah, to me Kevin Atukala, he he lives in Sydney Australia uh and he's originally from Tanzania uh I found him through a website called Upwork I literally cool. was on this website which you know has designers and illustrators and other people from around the world. And uh, I was just looking for a black one. I, I was like, there were none. I was just, I just <laughs> kept scrolling. And then I found a black one. I was like, I, I wonder if he can draw. And I was like, D and so I, I was like, yo, you want to do this? Like submit a, like for this. And, you know, he sent me some concept art and it looked really great. And I said, you know, I think I'm gonna be able to work with this. Uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of back and forth. You know, I was very, mm. very, intentional in particular about, you know, every little detail. And I yeah. provided him lots of uh, information and, 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 and examples and things. Because, you know, another thing is like when you have someone who's drawing from another, who's from another country, there's just so many subtle, or even from another city, you know, there are people who've never been to New York City. And so that's where the setting is. So there are just certain things that someone yeah. might not know. And so, you know, uh, you know, it took us, you know, about a year you know, I would say from start to finish and, to, and not just all with the illustrator, but like I would say from when I wrote the draft to when it actually uh, was finalized, you know, I would say it was definitely a little over a year, but it was so worth it. It was an amazing experience. You know, Kevin, uh, I, I'm sorry, Kelvin, uh, he did uh, uh, just a tremendous job. You know, he really uh, brought, uh, you know, my book to life Um and, you know, children have been responding accordingly. You know, every mm. teacher, every parent I talk to talk about how funny it is and how the kids are like rolling on the floor laughing. And that's yeah. that's exactly why I wrote the book. You know, yeah, that's, that's really cool. what it was about. That's cool. Is man. it in the bookstores? Uh, I mean, Amazon. sorry, in the, in the barbershop, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's not. You know, right now, all the books that are in uh, barbershop books are... Um, are, are paperback so they're the soft you know books because you know we know that books will be uh damaged or permanently borrowed so <laughs> we really kind of uh you know plan for that um and and we use books that are uh, you know not too um expensive to be able to replace yeah. um yeah. yeah yeah makes sense it's so bad. Uh, moving forward, what uh, what does life look like for you, and what does life look like for the business? What's uh, what's going on? Well, uh, you know, barbershop books. Our our goal is to expand to eight hundred barbershops over the next three years across twenty target cities. Uh, uh, and uh, then, um, in terms of me, you know, I just want to continue to increase. Um, you know, the number of uh, kind of the amount of public speaking that I do, you know, wanting to do a lot more keynotes, a lot more uh, trainings and workshops with educators, really just really sharing a lot of the ideas uh, that I've shared with you today, uh, as well as talking about the importance of cultural competency uh, and the role that humor and play, uh, uh, you know, really should have uh, in in mm. in early childhood education. Um, and then also stand-up comedy. Well, you know, I just uh, recorded a, a comedy album uh, at Gotham Comedy Club, uh, which is one of the top you know, yeah. comedy clubs here in New York City. I uh, did 45 minutes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to being able to, you know, you know, turn that into a comedy album and, and, and really, you know, 
uh, have it be available, you know, online for people to download and purchase. And, um, cool. and then, you know, probably submit to a few places, see if I can, you know, land a, 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 a comedy special somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That's and super you, cool. You recently did a, a fundraiser. Is that right? In uh... Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Last Tuesday. Oh, that, uh, uh, yeah. We did a, a comedy fundraiser. Uh, and I, uh, you know, you know, kind of, uh, recorded my comedy album. I had a lot of really uh, funny comedians on the show uh, and we were able to raise several thousand dollars, uh, you know, for barbershop books. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, that's so cool, man. And uh, yeah. So, but just uh, what, what uh, is the best way like for listeners to maybe get in touch with you, you know, on social media and to support the business and, you know, just well, help you out in general. Yeah, so if anyone wants to learn more uh, about Barbershop Books, they can uh, check out our website. It's barbershopbooks.org. Um, so barbershopbooks.org. Uh, they can also, you know, of course, connect with us on social media uh, at Barbershop Books. And if anyone wants to, you know, watch some of my comedy clips or uh, learn more about me, uh, they can uh, visit my website, Um uh, alvinirby.com uh, or they can connect with me on social media as well um, at uh, Alvin Irby uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Cool stuff, Brilliant. man. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, just, I mean, we've had such a great chat. Thank you so much, Alvin. I think what you're doing is, uh, well, clearly it's created a spark. Uh, like you said, other people are following what you're doing. Uh, and I think that's, you know, a proof of concept, you know, that, that, it, that it's really valuable and that you, you're genuinely helping others and not, not just for that fuzzy, warm and fuzzy part of it, you know, which is really awesome. So like, uh, and just beware today, we, the warm and fuzzies. Yes, yeah, exactly. The warm and fuzzies. <laughs> we um, are really appreciative of your time and, um, and we appreciate you coming on. We, I think you're really a uh, nice person, but uh, clearly also uh, pretty funny. And uh, I'm definitely going to think of uh, walking you through the, uh, the uh, cigarette <laughs> <Airport laughs> in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I do look forward and I, and I really um, implore our listeners to, to check out your website. Um, there's, you know, you, if you donate something there, it's going to a very, very uh, valuable cause and we know where it's going. So that's uh, means a lot. So thanks once again from from my side, um, and uh, we we can't wait to see where you head with us. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, it was really a pleasure uh, and a great conversation. Yeah, that's cool, man. And and just from my side, I, you know, first of all, we put together a lot of uh, show notes, so all the you know relevant points in our discussion will be there, as well as your uh, your handles on social media and websites and book and everything. So. Uh, people can see that on the website and and i'm pretty sure that right now uh i have international shipping cool uh so I, on on amazon so uh I, I i like so yeah so if you uh you know i mean you can buy it from my website you know uh alvinerby.com you can also find gross greg on uh, uh on amazon but uh, i'm pretty sure that i would be able to um get the book shipped out uh, if Great. people order it, yep. Awesome. I think I'm I'm gonna have to buy a gross Greg because my sister's uh, boyfriend, his name is Greg, and you know, oh, just kind of yeah. uh, he <laughs> loves picking his nose, so it's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, gross Greg is not autobiographical. It's not. Autobiographical. <laughs> I taught kindergarten. There were lots of gross Greg uh, that's in my so class. That's classic. Yeah. So, 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 buddy, like, just wanted to say thanks so much for you know, for coming on the show and just adding a great, like a bit of humor to the show. It's, it's always nice just to have a good laugh. And we just, I agree. I yeah. like a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that too. <laughs> uh, classic. You see, right? that, that's what it's all about, but you know what I mean? Like now you're going to have like a, a handful of South African jokes to say at your next big, okay. big evening at Gotham center. So, you know, it's awesome. Um, but no, no, just seriously, like what you're doing is really, really amazing. And it genuinely comes from a great place. You know, the world needs more awesome people like yourself. 
uh, and it's just it's just such a nice thing that you're doing and it's so great that it's getting traction and um, it really resonates super well with both Craig and I and tons of our listeners that they, they, they love these type of things um, so yeah thank you so much you know just for for sharing the story for doing what you're doing uh, we're rooting for you going forward and um, you know if we if we do manage to hook up uh, in in the states then that'll be really really cool too and we'd love to see you uh, on stage and heckle you for sure you know what i mean like yeah, we, for we, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thanks very much for your time bud appreciate it all right man talk to you later cool man <laughs>